Thank you everyone for joining us today. Welcome to the DIME Virtual Journal Club. Today we have some resources to share from the Digital Health Measurement Collaborative Community. In May, at the end of May, we launched some resources from the, from the first year of Data CC work. And today we're really excited to take a deeper dive into these resources and show you how these can be applicable to your work right now. So first, uh, some quick housekeeping. Today's session is being recorded. Um, we invite you to participate in the discussion. So if you have a question, you can raise your hand and I, I or one of the other moderators will call on you or you can put your questions in the chat. Um, the slides and recordings will be available after the meeting. So we're all here because we recognize the value of digital medicine. In fact, digital health technologies and measurements are providing us the opportunity to create a better, more robust healthcare through improved health outcomes, health economics, and health equity. And as the saying goes, I couldn't help myself, but with great power comes great responsibility. And so how do we use digital measures to improve care, but not violate privacy? How do we use the vast data sources to improve public health without facilitating harmful surveillance? And how do we promote digital health measures in a digital divide, but still improve access and ensure health equity? To do this, the, the Digital Medicine Society turn to collaborative communities. So uh, these are a priority by the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. And collaborative communities bring together diverse stakeholders in a pre-competitive space to tackle specific challenges. The Digital Health Measurement Collaborative com Community convened to modernize the way we measure and define health using digital approaches. DataCC is 46 organizations across the healthcare continuum working to achieve the promise of digital health measurement to improve lives. <clears throat> DataCC, or the steering committee for DataCC, prioritized inclusion for the first projects. And this led to two work streams on driving inclusion in digital health measurement product. The first focused on develop the product development life cycle with the goal of ensuring that diverse voices are included in all stages of the product development life cycle. And the second project focused on deployment to operationalize inclusivity in the deploying of digital health measurement products. Core to these projects are the vectors of inclusion. We built on the demographics identified by NIH for those underrepresented in biomedical research and added some elements that are specific to digital. Our projects are driven by the Data CC steering committee and our project teams. And when needed, we also seek out additional expertise. So I would love to start with a quick round of introduction to the people who made these resources possible. So panelists, if you'll please briefly introduce yourselves. Um, we'll start with Jamila and then go down the list. Good day, my name is Jamila Jemison. I am a clinical director uh, for the digital medicine team at MindMed and MindMed develops uh, drugs and digital tools for CNS and mental health. Thank you, Jamila. Jean? Hi everyone, I'm Jean Chung. I'm program lead at Digi um, the Digital Medicine Society, almost said that. And um, I had the privilege of leading Data CC's steering committee and project teams through this great body of work that we're gonna talk about you today or share with you today. Great. And then uh, Kristen. Hi, I'm Kristen Size. I lead the study devices program over at Verily. So my teams build hardware and software products for evidence generation within our clinical studies platform and for the development of digital biomarkers. Thank you, Kristen. Mitchell? 
Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Mitchell Tang. I'm a second year or third year PhD student at Harvard Business School. And my research is focused on kind of examining the growing role of digital technologies in healthcare delivery. Thank you, Mitchell. And Nicole. Hi everyone, my name is Nicole Braccia. I am a pharmacist by training and the policy director at National Patient Advocate Foundation. We're a nonprofit organization focused on improving equitable access to quality care and have been advocating um, most recently on a number of policies, both legislative and regulatory to improve um, and uh, decrease health disparities in care and digital health is no exception. So appreciate the chance to be here. Thank you everyone. We're so honored that you could join us today and, and share your expertise. So let, let's jump right in. All right. So the toolkit for inclusive digital health measurement product development has four tools or four resources that we will talk about today. But first I wanna talk quickly about the library of evidence. The library, library is a support for all the tools you'll be seeing today. And it plots the inclusion vectors against specific benefits to be gained from being, from being inclusive with your product development or you will see with product deployment. But to begin this process, we need to build a business case. And we start the business case with the market opportunity calculator. So now I'd like to turn over to Mitchell and Jean uh, to walk us through the opportunity calculator. Awesome, thanks, Yashoda. Let me share the screen. Uh, back to exactly where you left off, Yashoda. So yeah, let me, I'm gonna do a quick demo of the tool and then uh, Mitchell and I will have a conversation around um, how we, how he built it and how it can be used in the field. So the market, market opportunity calculator is a web embedded tool that helps us understand the very first big chunks of building the business case. So let me just talk, uh, take you through the steps really quickly. First step, you're able to choose a major health condition and compare it across major inclusion vectors. So for example, today for the demo, we'll choose diabetes and rate and ethnicity. And you'll see that it automated, automatically populates. We've got the inclusion strata here, the population strata, and then we put side by side the distribution of this health condition across the population strata. What's cool about this page in the first step, it gives you a visual very quickly about the opportunity for this particular health condition to make bigger impact. So it shows you the over, like the incidence rate, we're calling it over and under index, of this particular health condition across the particular population segments. So here we get an idea of where we can apply our efforts for innovation. The next step is really cool. This is kind of the fun part. So if we think about, we're all here trying to innovate for improvements and improved outcomes. And let's say I'm a designer and I'm understanding that my version one of the tool is that it has, let's say 30% engagement. And my goal is to move everyone who's over indexed for this health condition to above 80. So by doing this, I can say like, hey, look at this cool work that I'm doing but also it gives you the population affected by this improvement. So we move in this particular segment from 1.2 to 3.5. So we can automatically understand kind of the size, the magnitude of this particular innovation. Then we think about the numbers, right? We're in here, we've got like our commercial interests and we wanna understand, let's say this particular new product will be 99 bucks. So what does that mean? It takes the population at the current level, at everyone's at 30% engagement, multiplies by 99 bucks, and you say right now we're about an $800 million opportunity. With my improvements moving us to above 80 engagement, this is the opportunity, right? We've got 1.27 billion, 1.27, 1.7 billion dollars. And then it shows us the delta. 
So for my work, moving from 30% engagement to 80% engagement, I get an idea that this is pretty much a billion dollar opportunity. So this is where you get to play, like where you think you can make an impact with your work. The third step is basically the summary. So we've created a single sheet that at the bottom you can download and look at your results. And then the easy thing is just go to, go to the beginning and start again with your areas of interest. So that's the model in and of itself. I'm going to stop sharing and have a conversation with Mitchell. Let me find you in the Brady Bunch matrix. Hi, Mitchell. Um, so good to see you. I'm excited for you to share the story here. Um, I will lead up the, the conversation with you about kind of why we wanted to build a model. We were like, okay, we've got the mandate from the steering committee. It has to be like, how do we be more inclusive? And then we're thinking the why, right? Not the big why of like, we have to be inclusive and do this work, but why from a business case. And digging around, we found like very hard to find members. And my mandate to you was say like, okay, can we actually find members and put some rigor around building a business case? And so with that broad mandate, I handed it off to you. Tell me a little bit how you shaped um, your work to try and find members to build business cases. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think part of the struggle with kind of finding the specific numbers to, you know, support a business case is, you know, every, every product is kind of different. You're looking at different segments, you're looking at different inclusion vectors. But I think there's kind of a few central ideas that seem true across, you know, a whole host of products and a whole host of different inclusion vectors one might consider. And I, I think I, I kind of boil these down to three. So one, uh, historically underserved populations reflect like a meaningful portion of the US population. Um, but two, this is, these segments are especially important when we're talking about a health product, given the higher disease burden that many of these segments face. And so three, uh, when you're thinking of improving the accessibility and inclusivity of these products, uh, when we're talking about health, there, there's a potential for substantial return. So these all felt like ideas that were kind of universal, but also felt like they could be quantified uh, in a way that would be you know, broadly useful. And so the way we went about it, um, you know, the census provides all sorts of demographic data and boiling down the US population into different kind of segment sizes along those inclusion vectors that you showed and Gina mentioned. Um, but then also we can marry uh, other data sources looking at the, health states and the disease burden for these segments. So we can understand, you know, what percent of the population that's low income has diabetes or what have you. On the flip side, we can actually also take that data and kind of invert it, which is what the model uh, that Gene Walkthrough is showing. So not only can we say, you know, low income population has this rate of diabetes, we can also say if you're focusing on a diabetes product, what percent of that population is low income? What percent of that population is visually impaired? It, it really allows you to kind of quantify the importance of that segment when you're focused on, you know, a diabetes fo focused product, for example. And then on top of that, you can model scenarios. Um, there's a lot of, you know, you can use this in a whole host of different ways, but essentially this notion of if we're going to improve the inclusivity, improve the accessibility, Kind of what, what can we uh, expect in terms of expanding the opportunity size, both in terms of kind of the overall population and monetarily? And so uh, as Gene kind of walked through the model, uh, that's what we hope to, to capture. And again, kind of this generalizable way that, that was true across different uh, conditions and different uh, inclusion vectors. Fantastic. Um, I had a, I had so much fun working with you. And I'll just add a little call here for everyone on the line is that when on the dime side, noodling, like how do we, what do we do in this space around building a business case? I was very skeptical that we could pull together something that would be meaningful and have these results. So kudos to you being able to pull all these different data sources together to give us this model that we can start really grounding in, um, looking at understanding and shaping major health conditions and the opportunities. Tell me a little bit about your thoughts, like how we can evolve this. So I know first is we want everyone to know about it, we want everyone to play with it. I just chuck the link to it into the chat. 
Um, but having built it, like, where do you think we can evolve this? Yeah. And so I think, um, you know, one of course is using it. I think one, uh, one aspect of the, of the benefits of the model is I, I think it hopefully makes kind of an overall business case for inclusivity, regardless of what condition you're looking at. Yes, we're focusing on kind of the conditions that we had data for, but I think it makes kind of a broader point that I, I think is useful. But in, in terms of kind of more specific use cases, um, Gene, you, you kind of went through the example of, you know, as you're doing the scenario model, you can tie it to specific initiatives or certain things that one might do either in the development or the deployment process. And so I think it could be really useful there. And then in terms of how the model kind of evolves over time, I think um, th this kind of framework can extend to other conditions, can extend to other inclusion vectors. We've only represented a, a subset that we had uh, kind of readily available data for, but I think the approach is, is quite generalizable. And even to instances where the data is not publicly available, if you know a certain organization has their own um, you know, specific uh, product specific data, it, 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 it could still apply, uh, be applied in a, in a similar fashion. And so hopefully, you know, we can improve the model, but at the same time, it can serve as a, a, a template almost for people to do their, their own things, kind of modeling off that example. Yeah, amazing, love it. Um, thank you for that. Uh, we have a little bit of time left and before we um, jump to the next tool. And I wanted to open up to any questions, any, um, any of the participants today before we move on. I know it's a it's a, a big tool, but conceptually, I think we all kind of track with its um, with its utility. So Rachel has her hand raised. Oh, Rachel, okay. are, are you in a place where you can come off mute and ask? Yeah, your sure, sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you for. Oh, I'm Rachel Chassie, um, working in digital operations at Abbey. Uh, I'm pleased to bits to see this market calculator. Hallelujah. I want to thank you all first and foremost for putting this together. Um, I don't have a question, but more of a comment. So we, we all know that the FDA did a drop its draft guidance, not for digital, but for the diversity plans, right, to be submitted with new applications. And so uh, the draft guidance will be broken down to different sections of a diversity plan that you need to be submitted, but a lot of it also hinges upon uh, how a condition is reflected in populations, right? And so uh, oftentimes whenever a big sponsor like mine can, thinks about how is it reflected in populations, we ask other partners to aggregate that data, um, uh, CRLs, et cetera. And you know, I've, I've seen some of the time that data is reported in a way that's not very useful. For example, just skimming over key differences in stats and one like between like prevalence rates and incidence rates, right? So I'm very pleased to see this available currently, and it seems to be broadly applicable, not just to digital applications, but also overall applications that can be used in a broad way to different, different kinds of teams submitting diversity plans, for example, just the way that Mitchell re replied. Um, Jean, you also mentioned you're a little bit skeptical of pulling all this information together. I feel like Dime could do anything, and so putting this together is really fantastic. So thanks for doing that, and you know, my comment really just that this is applicable to all kinds of work, um, especially with the the new draft guidance. So kudos and thanks. Thanks, Rachel. Great to see you here. Um, and with that, I think we're done with the the, the calculator. I'll pass back to you, Shara. Great. Thank you both. Um, this work, Mitchell, is amazing. We we talked about it for quite a quite a while. Um, and just having seeing you go from our our very small idea to this really remarkable and helpful uh, tool is wonderful, and and it's just an indication of the very bright future you have ahead of you. Okay, so um, we're going to jump right back in to the. Um, to the digital health measurement product development process. So this process, or the life cycle that we also refer to, um, is modeled- Oh, you showed you're sharing the wrong screen. You're sharing um, the oh. runner show. Oops, sorry, <laughs> let me, that's not what I need to share. I apologize for that. Um, 
There we go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Um, so we want to turn to the digital health measurement product development process. And so this process um, or life cycle is modeled after the FDA develop the FDA device development process. And so we have it, the process laid out with each of the steps and some simple definitions um, for each of those steps. And these, this process then leads it to the framework. And the framework is organized in Google Slides so it can seamlessly move, so you can seamlessly move through each step or jump through, jump to a specific preferred step. And we start with a simple table of contents. The first step in the process is problem to solve. And so the, I just want to show you the layout here. So the, the step at which you're focused on is highlighted, so problem to solve. We then identify some common problems that are associ associated with this step for inclusivity and the potential risk. From there, we identify some key steps that should be considered in order to add some inclusive elements. And then we offer inclusivity considerations to help guide you through identifying the inclusive elements to add. And then the tools and resources link to specific uh, resources that can help with being more inclusive at that step following the, the inclusivity considerations and key steps. And then this is repeated for each of the step along the development process. So Kristen, you have done some, some work with product development. Um, can you share your thoughts on the process and, and the framework? Sure. Yeah, I really like how the process framework gives teams tools sort of each step along the way and things to look at as they're going through to make sure they're looking with an inclusion lens at each step because it's really critical to build this thinking into the development process so it doesn't get dropped or just kind of tacked on at the end because those are what results in, in a really poor user experience um, and lack of, of <clears throat> take up of the product. So from my perspective, there's kind of two steps in this framework that that really stick out to me as, as being critical. One is the tangible product design step. Um, so I'm a product designer myself. Um, this is a place where I really see a lot of missteps, especially with tech first companies. And so thinking through the inclusion, um, you know, in all of its forms, as you're building the product really is, a, it makes it a lot easier. It's a lot less costly from an engineering perspective um, to just bring those in as you go. And honestly, if you build something for these populations, then it's going to almost always be a better product for, for everyone. Um, and then I think the other step that I really love is the V3 testing piece, which I know is music to dimes ears, but um, we know that clinical studies are, can be non-representative. We know there's bias in algorithms. We know this is a thing we have to do better at. And so really the only way to resolve these is to focus on inclusion when we do do that verification and the analytical validation and clinical validation. Um, and this is where my team, you know, in our <clears throat> trying to bring um, precision health to everyone is really like building devices and tools that let us generate that objective real world evidence to know, um, you know, are things working? Who are they working for? Um, and so I love this framing. Right. Thank you. Um, I think not having this background myself, it's really nice the way um, the layout of this and being able to see to see how each component is connected, but as as well as being able to, I think if you in the middle of a process, you can still jump in um, and add some inclusive elements as well. So we know having the product, even developing the product inclusive inclusively is not sufficient. Um, you have to ensure that those who can benefit from the product most have access. And so Data CC also set out to operationalize inclusive deployment. So when a digital health product is introduced in healthcare or research, how can we ensure that that product is effective for all individuals who can benefit from it? And there, Three key considerations 
um, that we've identified for when deploying a digital health measurement. The first is focused on patients or participants in communities. And they have to be the primary focus. We really need to better understand those that we're serving. Um, and with that, developing trust. We know trust is of critical importance. The second component is detailed instructions. Detailed instructions are needed to deliberately and successfully implement inclusion um, in, in workflows. And then finally, uh, resources from experts across the healthcare ecosystem. We know that we can't do this in isolation. Not one single group has not been able to do it so far. And this is one of the reasons we have turned to DIME. Um, and so having access to resources and um, learning from others is also gonna be really helpful as we move, as we try to advance health equity. So for patients and participants and the community, we need to first reach these patients and participants where they are and starting with developing community partnerships. And so we have a, a, we've created a, a guide to help with developing a, um, community partnerships and then using that guide to develop a deliberate engagement plan. And so there's also a, a tool in here for um, inclusive engagement. But what I wanna focus on today is the, oops, that's not what I wanna, I wanna focus on our, our users, our patients and participants. And so, We've created a workbook to help prepare end users to empower them to be better aware of digital health products and, and the role they serve in their lives. And so again, this is organized as a Google slide deck for simplicity. Um, we have a table of contents listing the various tools. And I'm gonna just highlight one of those tools, which is a simple end user license agreement. Uh, you're all digitally savvy, you're all highly educated, and I'm sure you have struggled with understanding end user license agreement. And so one of the key things that we've identified for patients and participants is helping them to understand uh, to, to how to read or navigate the end user license agreement and the, and the information to be gained from that. So the workbook is organized with the summary for each of the tools, uh, including a summary of the inclusivity impact, the purpose of this resource, the intended users, and when it can be used. And then there is a link to that resource. And so this repeats for addition, the additional tools within the, the workbook. So Nicole, I would love to turn to you. Much of your work has been focused on educating and helping patients to advocate for themselves. Can you tell us a little bit of how you think these tools can be used for that? Yeah, absolutely, thank you. And before I get into that, I just wanted to also share, I think, um, the, I appreciate the intention of DIME and Data CC to incorporate patient perspectives, you know, consumer perspectives early and often throughout the entire product development process. I think that's certainly an area where um, there's a lot of talk about, you know, getting that done, but this group is the one to actually get it done. So really appreciate um, that, you know, being a priority as part of this. Um, and I think you know, what I learned when we talk to our patients, um, I work at the advocacy affiliate side, which is National Patient Advocate Foundation, and we build a lot of educational tools, both, um, you know, written materials, such as some of the resources you have here, um, but also we have um, essentially calls and coaching sessions to really 
also learn from the patients um, who are served by our direct service counterpart. So we learn about the challenges they're facing, accessing medications, devices, treatments, everything in between, um, but also how to communicate with the healthcare system, including doctors and you know, potentially um, product developers as well. So I think of note, I would say the um, resource three, the questions to ask uh, patient perspective, resource is extremely instrumental in meeting patients where they are. Um, and the, I guess, behind that is the fact that, especially when it's a new technology or something that's a little bit um, different from a person's everyday life, they don't know what they don't know. So having this resource that really goes through, here are things that you should bring up to the, um, you know, the project lead or whoever's conducting um, the research or um, the tools that will, you know, set the person up so that they're informed about what they're getting themselves into and know what questions to ask um, and can build off of that. And then I think the second tool, um, number six, the context of daily life. I love that this resource includes not only, you know, healthcare questions, but it's, really looking at you know financial social technology needs so that it's you know taking into account the whole picture um, when we think about person centered care i think having the context of a person's daily life both so that the the end user knows what to expect and how this will impact their everyday life. But it goes likewise for the um, project leads to kind of know what to expect um, in terms of how the products will be used. And I think that is key to making sure that these teams are really meeting patients where they are. So it's certainly a two way street um, where, you know, each is kind of learning um, and meeting in the middle because I think that is the one essential aspect of building trust. It's not to expect the patient to know everything and study their way, you know, to, um, to be prepared, but it's, you know, preparing them, but also having the product teams um, kind of meet them halfway. And I think these tools really help to create that, um, that reciprocity. Great. Thank you. Um, and, you know, you, you mentioned patients, but I think, um, ha coming from a researcher background, I think this is going to also be very um, valuable to researchers um, who are participating in, in digital clinical trials or um, regular uh, translational research as, as well. So speaking of research, we also um, recognize that the teams, the clinical and the research teams also need support. And if, as, as I mentioned earlier, if it was easy or if one person could, could do it, we would, have, we would have done it. And so we, we know that we need um, to approach this from multiple perspectives, not only the patients and the participants, but the, the teams that are actually doing the work. And so the data CC team, um, developed the inclusive deployment workbook for implementation. Um, and again, we organize this to make it simple and a seamless for use. And similar to the other workbooks, we also have a, a table of contents um, listing out each of the tools. And then we have a, a summary slide so you can quickly um, scan and identify the individual tool that is of most value or more most relevant to you. And then similarly, the each tool is organized with a, the inclusivity impact, uh, the purpose of the tool and the intended users and then a quick link to it. And so I would love to turn to you, to you Jamila. When we launched these tools, um, you shared the value that some of these tools can bring to existing workflows. So I would love if you can expand on that a little bit. Absolutely, thank you, Yashoda. Um, so the thing about all of these 
uh, workbooks here is that there's multiple tools within them. And so of course you have to pick um, sort of the right one to kind of jump in immediately. Um, and I think uh, that there are three places that you can easily get started, particularly with, with deployment. And I, I, I say easily in terms of you can go right to it and find it, but um, my, my actual favorite tool uh, in this particular set is the inclusive deployment checklist, which when you go look at it, you will find has a lot of homework uh, to do on it. But the reason I think it's the most important place to start is because it gives you a framework for what success looks like. You know, if you come to this and you feel like, oh my goodness, this is really overwhelming. There are all these stakeholders I have to, I have to think about. There are all these um, you know, different things that I need to develop. You know, this can focus you and it also gives you a way to both look forward and look back. So someone could jump in with this inclusive deployment checklist and examine the process of a recent tool that got deployed and see which things you've already done and where there are gaps. And then you can go and make a plan to fill in those gaps. Or if you're lucky enough to be uh, have finished with the tool and just be ready to deploy it, you can start by understanding what you need to do and then go make your plan using again, another worksheet here. Um, my number two in this uh, set is the inclusive communication guide, um, because this is something that I think you're gonna come back to again and again, because not only do you, you know, you, if you're someone who is championing this in your workplace, need to be able to, to communicate with people, you've got to help other people kind of learn the lingo. Um, I definitely think that that Buddhist principle of, uh, you know, right, right thoughts, right words, right actions comes into play here. And if you can get everyone starting to get their communication on the same page, I think that's going to flow into the rest of the work that they do. Um, if you find that you've got a tool um, that's ready to go out into the world and someone says, but we need to, you know, we need to start working on inclusivity right, right away. You can also go to the last tool in this workbook, which is around the informed consent, um, because this is uh, one of the most critical uh, pieces of how you interact with your end user. And if you can start there as a place to get something right, just as it's going out the door, um, it won't, it won't solve everything about that tool, but it will, it will get you on the road and um, it will get that team thinking about how that needs to happen. And then you can start to, you know, build the path uh, behind them. Uh, and, and next time something rolls out, you start a little bit earlier in the process. Um, and each time you get a little bit, you get a little bit uh, more integrated with the inclusive deployment process in your tools. Right. Thank you, Jamila. Um, I think the communications piece is so important because we we tend to take that for granted, um, and we get really caught up in in our own own little small worlds and the way we speak with each other that we forget that that doesn't apply to everyone else um, that we need to work with. Thank you. So I want to I'm going to stop sharing because I would like for us to. Um, have a little bit more of, of, of a conversation. And um, the, the toolkits are really are fit for purpose and they can be used in, independently. Um, and so I'd, I'd love to hear um, your, your thoughts on this. There's the opportunity also to customize the experience. And, and one example is early user testing when we're developing a product. And so, Kristen, I'll, I'll call to you first um, to help us get started here. Tell us why early user testing is important to the process in general and, and why these inclusion guidelines um, are, are necessary. Sure, so I think, you know, from my perspective, we're very focused on getting good data, right? And good data means both having sensors that can collect good data um, or surveys or, or other tools, but also having people use the, the device or the app or the, the piece of data collection um, software that you've provided. And so I think early using user testing does two things. One is it allows you to de-risk the actual technology in terms of is it working on 
all of the different um, types of people that this needs to work on. For example, there's an article, um, again, published recently on pulse ox and skin tone, right? So doing the work early to say, are we actually getting good data across all of the populations? Do we understand any nuances there? And then the other piece is the usability piece and making sure that people are going to want to use the device. Is it comfortable to wear? Is it easy to use the app? Um, all of those things. If it's not, they're just not going to do it. They're not going to use this, this piece of information this piece of hardware or software that makes their lives more difficult. And so you really do need to do that testing early to make sure you're on the right track. Um, because again, having to redesign <laughs> your app, you know, 10 months in because you found out that um, you can't translate the language without it going off the screen. Like simple things like that can be really um, problematic when you start to, to bring things in too late. So, so Mitchell, um, you alluded to this earlier of how um, the the market opportunity calculator can be used for um, different purposes. Do you see an opportunity with something like the selecting end users for testing? Do you see an opportunity there with the, the market calculator? Yeah, uh, I, I think so. Um, you know, one of, one of the kind of key set of statistics that the market calculator provides is the segment size, you know, if you're focusing on a specific condition or health status, trying to understand if I separate it based on a, a, a given inclusion vector, you know, what percent of my diabetes population is low income? What percent of my diabetes population has a, a hearing disability or vision impairment? And so, you know, as you're going through those inclusion vectors, you can you can kind of highlight segments that say this, you know, this is a, a very important segment uh, for my potential product. And so as you're thinking of, you know, users to potentially prioritize for testing or, you know, make sure that you're kind of considering them as you're going about your plan, I, I think the market calculator can kind of help to, to highlight areas of potential focus. And then, Nicole, can you walk us through some of how you have interacted with, with patients and, and how would you prepare them to be a part of um, a user testing with some of these tools? Yeah, I think there's sort of two sides to this. Um, the My colleagues over at our direct service counterpart, they are essentially case managers. They navigate people through the healthcare system. And the way that they start with their engagement is they ask, what is your most pressing concern? Um, so likewise with working through a process, um, inclusive um, product development process, they, I think the idea here is to understand what are the you know, main concerns or main questions and kind of start where they are as opposed to kind of diving in and you know, going through all of the, you know, the order of go that you know, the researcher or whomever um, would start from. Um, we also, uh, through our grassroots volunteer network, we are, you know, uh, working with patients who are, most of them are actually pretty savvy because they are, you know, advocates themselves. They either are patients, caregivers, um, they're usually well um, oriented in the healthcare system and have usually learned um, trial by error or trial by fire in terms of how to navigate. And so they you know, certainly have a higher health literacy level. But when we think about folks who either have not traditionally accessed the healthcare system due to having you know, no insurance or whatever the case may be, um, I think approaching from a place of trust is absolutely essential because so often implicit bias and all of these other structural and systemic issues in healthcare um, really turn people away from wanting to participate in clinical trials, participate in research, uh, and, you know, potentially even early user testing. Although I think to what Kristen said earlier, all of those points about the importance of doing that and incorporating underserved um, patient voices is um, obviously going to be really important for ensuring that the product at the end of the day, you know, is um, me measuring or is um, utilized in a way that will be impactful and um, convenient and um, important to the people that it's intended to reach. Um, so I think, you know, again, two-way street, you know, having the conversations um, from a very you know, uh, even eighth grade reading level, I think using language um, that is, you know, um, coming from a patient's sort of cultural um, language and all these other aspects 
um, will be important. And one place I think um, patient advocacy groups can can help and to even use these tools um, would be, you know, when we are talking with patients about challenges or new um, products that they're interested in, in, in learning about, we can share these tools with them, uh, specifically the, um, the questions to ask and the context of daily life so that people can be aware of kind of um, what the process may look like, similar to what we've done with um, when telehealth became, you know, a much more common um, type of care delivery for people, we've created tools that help people understand how, you know, this visit might be different, the technology um, and other aspects that they need to raise with their clinician when they're having their visit and even leading up to their visit. So I think um, patient advocacy groups are certainly a place for broad dissemination of tools like this, because many of our groups, um, NPAF included, work with grassroots network reaching thousands of or more patients throughout the country. Yeah, yeah. And I think, uh, Nicole, you also uh, allude to one thing that we, we talked about earlier, which is um, the, the digital aspect of, the, of this all and the digital divide. And we have Amy Schoen and Gina um, on, the, on the call today. And so I would love to hear some of what you all have, have been doing with um, working with with your your um, members on the digital divide and how these inclusion tools can help with that. Hi everyone. Amy, do you want me to start? And then yeah, you... please do. Please okay. Do. I've loved this conversation today. Um, anecdotally, I just, someone brought up a pulse oximeter earlier and we're talking about digital bias. And um, so I am a lifelong asthmatic since I was a child. I have had asthma. I don't, as an adult, I don't get asthma attacks really that much anymore. But earlier this year, I had an asthma attack. Um, I happen to have a pulse oximeter in the house from COVID and I put it on my finger because I was just like, I can't tell if I'm really having about to have an asthma attack or not because I'm an adult now so the symptoms are a little bit different and it was like at it was at 99 so basically my oxygen was good so I was just like okay I'm fine and the next morning I woke up and I had to go to the ER because I could not catch my breath so when we we're talking about digital bias and digital devices and digital tools at first I had experience about how that impacts people of color people who look like me people who are black and brown um sorry that I went into that that story but this conversation has really excited me and got like me thinking a lot um so so my name is um, Gina Cooper Benjamin. I am the deputy director of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance or NDIA. I'm located in Massachusetts on Nipmuc land. I'm going to share a little about NDIA and some thoughts on the toolkits for inclusive development. First, NDIA is a unified voice of digital inclusion practitioners and advocates representing community-based organizations, housing authorities, libraries, and others working towards digital equity in their communities. We provide spaces and opportunities for practitioners to meet and discuss what's happening in their local communities. And we take what we learn and we create resources for our community. And we take what we learn and we advocate for our community. Um, if you haven't guessed yet, one of our biggest values is our community. Community is centered in all of our work. We would love for you to join our community to discuss um, of digital inclusion experts, advocates, and newbies. Um, we have important conversations. You can share what you know and learn from others. Our listserv is a robust learning circle with constant exchanges of new ideas, policy updates, and important questions. There are two other ways to get involved too. I'd like to just take this opportunity to share more about Digital Inclusion Week. It's um, a week every year, the first week of October. This year is October 3rd through 7th. It's an annual week of awareness, recognition, and celebration to uplift digital inclusion efforts in communities across the country. We also have an annual conference that we call Net and Inclusion. It's an opportunity to be in community with other digital inclusion practitioners and to share and learn. That's happening February 28th through March 2nd in San Antonio, Texas. Um, about the toolkit. So we're excited about the toolkit for inclusive development and how we can share these resources with our community. The toolkit for inclusive development has been instrumental in terms of the health and technology sectors wanting to harness their incredible power for digital inclusion. We hope that the process of developing um, the toolkits planted seeds that will grow into partnerships across the country. Um, in our case study, we explore using the toolkits to apply the digital navigator model to healthcare settings. 
The digital navigators are trusted community members who are integral part of digital equity ecosystems. And we welcome all DIME participants to join NDIA and to take advantage of our resources, such as monthly community calls, our annual conference, and a lift serve um, who all of our community members rave about. I'll put our contact information in the chat. If you have any questions, let me know. Thank you so much for letting me be a part of this conversation and for having us today. Amy, did I miss anything? Um, no, that was great. Thank you. And just to, to add one other thing, the, the, the notion of linking the health and the technology communities with the digital inclusion ecosystems this is something I've been, been banging my head against the wall for eight years before the pandemic, but what's happened here through DIME has been like, this is what I've dreamed of, is really being able to, you know, have the whole health and technology communities really dive into digital inclusion, understand um, the language, and I hope it's just the beginning that you all really will take advantage of that NDIA membership, find the affiliates in your area, join the listservs, et cetera. Great, thank you, Gina. Thank you, thank you, Amy. Um, and and uh, Jamila, I'll, I'll call to you to kind of um, wrap, wrap, us, wrap us up on this section and then um, we'll open up to questions. So um, in terms of going back to early user testing as our case study here, um, there's, there's been discussion that taking time out to be inclusive um, can lead to extra cost or um, expand on the timeline and, and, and creating roadblocks. Can you talk a little bit about how we can make time for inclusion without compromising the process? Sure. I mean, it, it, it obviously takes awareness, which I think is a, a really important aspect of actually having this toolkit available, right? Because before you, you know, show up at a company meeting and say, we need to be inclusive and people would be like, yeah, yeah, but we don't know how. And now you can go, no, 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 wait, I know how. <laughs> Let me tell you what steps we need to take, you know, everywhere along the way. And now when you are, are developing your new tool, like we're just going to plan them in. Um, and then I think, once it's a, a part of what you're already doing, it just becomes more and more valuable um, as you go along. Uh, you know, there's this calculator, which is where we started this hour. And so you can show people sort of like the dollars and cents of what it means and also the, the, the demographic expansion um, and just also the broader user expansion of what it means to be more inclusive. And I think almost everybody can hear that message, but then as you go to them and say, okay, in order to get the cost of getting that expansion and being more successful and getting more dollars and cents and having a drug that does more good work for more people means we have to do this first. I think you can clearly show people that um, it's, it's worth uh, getting inclusivity right and just building it into your processes. And once it's once it's built in there and you go sort of through the cycle a couple of times, it will it will just start to naturally get more efficient. Um, I, I did actually just want to go back to sort of connectedness for a minute because uh, you showed you made a great point that um, the various bits of of this toolkit can be used separately. But uh, something that I found neat as I was reviewing for for this uh, uh, journal club today was that you know, this idea of the early user experience which sort of comes in development is what's gonna let you know what you need to do to prep your user, which is sort of that middle piece. And that ties into um, this, uh, the, the checklist for like end user preparation that you would then develop in, a, in deployment. So no matter where you start with this toolkit, you can eventually make it sort of all chained together. And, uh, the goal is for you to develop a flow where inclusivity um, isn't something you have to rack your brain about. It's just something that's already built into uh, how you develop and deploy. Very, very wise words. Thank you, Jamila. Um, I, if there's any questions, I'm not seeing any in the chat. If anyone has any questions, we invite you to come off mute and ask your question and share your video if you'd like.
Okay, I'm not seeing any any hands raised. Um, and I do want to make sure we end on time to be respectful of your time. So I'm just going to put up this one more slide. Um, and so I want to leave you with this call to action. Um, we are all very much aware of the disparities that exist in healthcare. Um, and digital, medicines, digital medicine is at a crossroads. We can choose to develop and add technologies to the current healthcare system, or we can choose to develop healthcare that serves all who need it. Um, digital medicine is relatively young. We have the opportunity to, to grow from a place of equity. And to do this, we wanna start with making it easy to be inclusive. We invite you to use these resources Tell us how you're using them with case studies, submit a case study um, and give us some feedback so we can improve them and share additional resources. Uh, we all have a part to play and just showing up today has shows, shows your commitment. So with that, I wanna say thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you for all the work you've done with helping to create these resources. And then thank you for coming here today to show everyone how we can start using these right now. Um, and we thank you all for joining us and participating in the Journal Club. And we look forward to seeing you at the next Journal Club. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to myself or Jean or anyone else um, at DIME. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.